So Alan Davis grew up in Hardwick. Um, his father's store is on the cover of Volume 5, Issue 1 of the journal. He graduated from Hardwick Academy in 1949, right? Absolutely. Right. He holds Hardwick Academy's record for scoring more touchdowns in football than any other player, which record will never be broken. <laughs> he went on to become a history professor retiring from Temple University in Philadelphia, and during his career, he developed courses in how to do family history beyond just the genealogical data. He's even written a book about it, and he's here to share the basics with us tonight. Welcome, Alan. Thank you for joining us. Well, it's a pleasure to talk to the Hardwick Historical Society, and it's particularly a pleasure to be in this space because I have fun memories of this growing up in Hardwick. Um, until they built what we used to call the new gym, this is where Hardwick Academy graduations took place, where Hardwick Academy plays took place, where all kinds of musical events uh, took place. Um, and um, there even were minstrel shows here with blackface, um, which somebody may deny, but I have clear memories of, of that. Uh, near the end of the war, Fress Dorton, who left Hardwick to go on and to found the country store at Weston, started another motion picture theater here. So for a brief time in Hardwick, we had two theaters to go to the movies. We had a debate on Friday night which theater we were going to go to. The, um, the projection wasn't perfect in this building, nor were the, the seats were hard. But those of us who had gone to the Idle Hour Theater knew about hard seats because up until 12 years old, we were forced to sit in the first six rows, which were hard. After that, they got a little, little uh, softer. Um, I also remember casting my first vote for president in this building. I came home from Dartmouth in the fall of 1952 to vote here why, I'm not quite sure, except I probably didn't get around to get an absentee ballot. And I voted up here on the stage. Um, by 1952, I had been weaned away from my family republicanism, and so I cast my first vote for Adlai Stevenson on this, uh, on this uh, stage. But I'll tell you a story about that vote. Um, which some of you may have heard, because I've told it before. But I, it was a paper ballot, of course, no, no machines in those days. I filled out the paper ballot, and I folded it, ready to take it to the ballot box. And somebody, a man, of course, I can't remember who he was, but he obviously knew who I was, and he stopped me before I put the ballot, my ballot in the box, and grabbed the ballot from me, opened it up to see how I had voted. <laughs> and I'm sure he told my father. <laughs> but uh, so, so I have um, um, uh, fond memories of this, um, of this building. I remember sitting here looking at this screen, this wonderful curtain, um, trying to imagine where that was. Uh, was it Switzerland or Italy or Austria? Um, I, I knew it wasn't Hardwick. Um, <laughs> and I dreamed of going to exotic places um, like that, and eventually I did. Um, I'm not sure I can see my notes, but I probably don't, uh, I don't need them in any, in any case. Um, I do want to talk about memory, and I do want to talk about genealogy and family history. Um, genealogy is, according to many accounts, the most popular hobby in the country uh, these days. We have websites like Ancestry.com. We have DNA kits that people can send for. How many of you have done your DNA? A few. I haven't done it uh, yet, although I think I better at some point. Um, um, 
there, there are all kinds of specialized trips you can sign up for to go trace your ancestors to Ireland, to Italy, to England. Uh, you can even take a special trip to Salt Lake City. Um, it's a booming hobby. Uh, some years ago, I was invited to give a lecture at the big in genealogical conference in Salt Lake City, um, which, because of the Mormon church, is a headquarters of genealogy. And if you've never, if you ever get there, go to see the genealogical library. But anyway, I was uh, amazed at the, the hundreds and hundreds of cars and vans that were in the parking lot for this conference, all of them with the names they were tracing. And um, I even got invited to a Davis party. Um, but I discovered that these Davises were much more interested in trying to authenticate their relationship with Jefferson Davis. Uh, and they were not very much interested in my New England Davises uh, uh, somehow or other. But genealogy has become a, 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 an exciting hobby for a lot of people. Um, I don't know how many of you have watched Finding Your Roots by um, Henry Louis Gates, Jr. Has anyone watched that on PBS? Um, uh, everybody who knows uh, Gates calls him Skip. Um, and um, he starts out with a DNA often, uh, and then with an army of researchers uh, goes and finds the information. Most of us don't have an army of researchers to do that sort of thing. Genealogy has been a long, around for a long time. And in fact, the kind of golden age of genealogy, so-called, was about from 1890 to 1910, uh, the very time when the country was being inundated with immigrants. And there's a connection with that kind of genealogy and the horde of immigrants who came in. Because the people doing genealogy in those days wanted to prove their legacy different from the immigrants from Italy, Eastern Europe, Ireland, and other places. They wanted to, to uh, suggest their superiority. And so it was at that time that organizations like the DAR, the Sons of the Revolution, the Mayflower Society, so forth, uh, were formed. And so genealogy was often the hobby of the rich and the well-born rather than ordinary people. Well, this sort of changed after the war, and particularly in the 70s. Uh, Alex Haley wrote a book called Roots uh, that became a very popular television series. Did, how many of you remember Roots? Well, it turned out that much of his book was fiction, particularly the African part of it. But it excited a lot of Americans into thinking, well, if he can trace his roots to Africa, well, we can trace our roots to wherever. And so genealogy became a hobby for a lot of people other than the rich and the, and the well-born. Uh, still, for, for, most, uh, for most genealogists, uh, finding the next generation, finding, creating a family tree, making a connection to a royal family, uh, and doing just the facts is what they're about. What I'm more interested in is, is the stories behind those, those facts. Uh, what did it feel like to live in a particular time and place? And what can we fill in to find out what lives were like in uh, different times and places? And so about the time that Alex Haley was writing Roots, and I once did appear at a conference in Washington on the stage with Margaret Mead and Alex Haley, so I was in, uh, in good company. But um, uh, I started using family history as a teaching device. I sent my students home to interview their own families as a way of understanding American history. Not the matter of presidents or secretaries of states, but what was it like for ordinary people? And eventually, I I put together a book called Generations, Your Family and Modern American History as a way to, to help students um, 
learn about how their family fit into bigger patterns. How are they affected by uh, migration and immigration? Uh, we all are a product of migrations and immigration. How were they affected by the Depression, by World War II? And in, those, in the 70s, you could still recover people who knew about World War II um, and, and other things of this sort. And I found that students were quite excited about this, and so were their parents and grandparents. Um, I, um, looking out at this audience, I would guess that you're mostly grandparents. Um, and you don't have to wait for your grandchildren to come and interview you. You should get busy writing your own story. Um, my step-grandmother, who a few of you might remember, Sarah Holden Davis, um, got so angry at her son when he put her in a nursing home when she was 89 years old that she sat down and wrote her autobiography. And she wrote it out in longhand, but it comes out to about 50 pages typed. But I don't, you don't have to wait till you get into the nursing home. You should start now. And you don't have to write an autobiography. You should just get a, a, a notebook or a bunch of blank pages and sit down now and then and write down memories of ordinary things. Because your grandchildren or their, your grandchildren's generation are growing up with um, Twitter and iPads and all kinds of other electronic devices, and they have no understanding of some of the things that uh, we remember. So you should, don't try to make a story that starts with your birth and goes on to the end, but start uh, just recalling memories of, of various things. Um, the, um, and uh, I profited from having a grandmother living with me until I was about 10. In fact, my memory of Har in Hardwick is all my friends had grandmothers at home. Of course, in the days of before Social Security, um, usually it was fell to the lot of the woman to take care of her mother. And I felt that I really gained a lot from having a grandmother in the home. And, and, and some of the ones I met. In fact, some of the grandmothers in Hardwick, I couldn't understand. Some had said Scotch brogues or spoke French. Uh, and um, so that's, a, that's a, almost a thing of the past. But um, I, want to, I want to play a little memory game with you. If you can imagine where you were when you were 10 years old. And can you imagine the place you lived, whether it's a house or an apartment? And can you draw a mental picture of that house? Um, where was the kitchen? Where was the, the uh, dining room, if you had a dining room? Uh, how many bedrooms were there? Who slept where? Uh, imagine a family meal. Where was it? In the kitchen? In the dining room? Who served? Um, how did you get your food? Did you pick it up or did, you, did somebody give it to you? Or imagine a, um, a Sunday meal or maybe a meal on a holiday, uh, perhaps a more formal setting than day to day. Um, who was in command of the table? Your mother? Your father? Your grandfather? I know at holidays my grandfather was in charge, although he didn't do anything except say a brief prayer. Did you have a prayer before meals? Anyway, think of your, 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 uh, uh, where you were at 10 years old. And if you ever wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and can't get back to sleep, 
you might think of all the places you've lived. You know, to, um, imagine one after the other. I lived in the same house in Hardwick until I went to college. As it turned out, that wasn't very good preparation for the life that I lived because I moved a great many times in the next 20, 30 years. So imagine where you've lived in apartments and rented rooms, in barracks and college dormitories, in houses and apartments, and try to imagine the, the layout of those places. Um, if you still don't get to sleep after that, you might think about all the cars you've owned um, or driven over the, over the years. Anyway, um, memory is a good part of family history, and you should start with your own memories. Um, the, the generation that, um, that, that is growing up today has little knowledge of anything. I used to, the, at the behest and suggestion of Helen Dimmick, for a number of years I went down once a month in the summertime to talk to the ladies at the nursing home in, in Greensboro. And they were almost always ladies. The men had somehow disappeared. And, um, and so we, we had fun talking about the old ways and of, that have now disappeared. We talked, for, about, for example, about um, cooking with a Glenwood range. How many of you had a wood-burning stove growing up? Imagine, uh, I, I can't imagine how my mother cooked so much on that wood-burning stove where you regulated the temperature simply by opening and closing the damper, putting in another piece of wood or poking the fire. And um, somehow she turned out all kinds of things. If you remember, most of these ranges were black. Uh, they had an oven um, in my house on South Main Street. The heat never circulated terribly well. And so we all raced down to the kitchen to get dressed in the morning uh, because and opened the oven door because that was where it, was, where it was warm. So so think about a Glenwood range being the source of, of heating and cooking uh, and write that down uh, in a, you know, two or three paragraphs about your memories of that. Um, wash day. People growing up today think wash, wash day is throwing your stuff in the automatic washer and then into the automatic dryer. But most of you remember a different kind of wash day with a gigantic machine and ringers and places to rinse things. You probably even know what bluing is. Um, um, so write your story of wash day because your grandchildren have no understanding of what wash day. And then of ironing on Tuesday Wash day was always Monday, of course. Um, and um, the, the generation before ours, ironing was a, was, a, was a strain because you heated the irons on top of the stove. And then if you made one mistake and got a little bit of dirt on, your, on the shirt or blouse, then you had to start all over again and wash it. So to, to talk about, write down your memories of wash day. And the telephone. Uh, I used to argue that I grew up in the 19th century because um, the 20th century didn't arrive in Hardwick until after World War II. That's an exaggeration, of course, but there's a certain amount of truth to that. And we kept the old-fashioned telephone system uh, for a long time. You remember you cranked the phone or in some cases just lifted the receiver and the operator said, number please and you gave the number. I was home from college in the, between semesters of my freshman year, in probably February of 1950, and one of my new friends from Dartmouth and I were gonna to get together. So he called me up in Hardwick, and of course he got the operator, Elva Archer, I believe, 
and he asked, and he asked for me. And Elva Archer said to him, "He's not at home. He's at the basketball game." <laughs> and, and my friend from Boston uh, wouldn't let me forget that uh, for a long time. Except I told him it, the system worked, didn't it? Remember, we called the operator um, if there was a fire, if there was an emergency of any kind, um, because that operator was 911 and, and all wrapped up in one, in one person. Um, um, off and on through high school, I went out with Patty Thomas, now Patty Thomas Shea, and I, I see her occasionally. And one time, a few years ago, we got talking about telephones in Hardwick. And I said to her, I even remember your telephone number. And she said, how could you possibly remember my telephone number? I said, it was 100. How could I forget it? <laughs> um, do you remember your telephone number? My, the telephone number at my house was 117 ring 2, written 117-2. But I was on a party line with the store, which was 117 ring 12. Um, and so my father could tell if it was a store call at the uh, house. So write down your memories of the old telephone system. We got, uh, we got dial telephones in Hardwick quite late. And then we got push button phones even later. I remember being at the Greensboro library when a young 10-year-old was trying to call his parents and there was a dial phone and he was sticking his fingers in the in the dial and nothing was happening so I had to show him uh, what the dial phone is all about. So write down your stories of telephones in growing up. Um, another thing that sh you might think about is what food you ate and how it was prepared. For a long time, my sister Florence, who some of you may remember, who turns 93 this summer, um, I had a hard time getting her to talk about our growing up. Um, but I could always get her started by talking about food, uh, particularly the food she didn't like. And one of the things she didn't like was, was fried salt pork and milk gravy. Um, I could share that. Uh, actually. Um, but in Hardwick, of course, we had dinner at noon and supper at night. There was no concept of lunch in Hardwick. In fact, uh, we all walked home from school to have dinner, which now seems quite amazing. My sister remembers Jeanette Badger walk walking all the way to Macville to have dinner at, and then walking back. Uh, and um, we, we, of course, stopped traffic in Hardwick with our, with our uh, oh, everybody walked in the middle of the road. Um, but food can be another entry that you should talk about. And, um, and if there, there may be old recipe books hanging around, and often those recipe books are written on uh, by the person who, who wrote it, uh, who, who used those cookbooks. So, so write about the food that you ate and the food that you prepared. And um, food is an important social history subject because um, it tells a lot about what ethnic group you come from, what your heritage is, and, um, and how it's prepared. Uh, it, it is important. So write those, those things down. I once consulted with a museum in Philadelphia about immigration into Philadelphia. Not everybody came through Ellis Island. A couple of million people came directly to Philadelphia. So we put out notices to people to get artifacts that had survived the migration from someplace in Europe into Philadelphia. And we got an overwhelming response. And most people had saved two kinds of objects from their trip from Europe to America. One was related to food, food preparation. The other was related to religion. And often the two were combined, you know, to make a, a particular meal 
that had a religious uh, connotation. So what artifacts survive in your family? Anyway, um, start with your own memories and write those down. And the stories you heard from your grandmothers or grandfathers, uh, which you probably still can remember. Um, I've discovered that there usually is a certain amount of truth in family legends. My grandmother, my mother's mother, used to say to me, we had an ancestor with, who was an aide to General Washington. Well, I discovered years later that our ancestor fought for 90 days as a private in General Washington's army. He was far from being an aide. But there was a little element of truth in her story. It just got exaggerated as time went on. I had a genealogist friend in Philadelphia who was hired by a family to try to authenticate the family legend that one of their ancestors fought in the Civil War. But they couldn't find him in any of the, the databases. And actually, the, the, the databases for Civil War veterans were pretty good. And so she went to work, and she actually found him. The problem was he'd fought for the Confederacy and not for the Union. And the family didn't really want to hear that. But so, so remember your family legends and your family stories, and write those down. The, um, um, but once you get beyond your own memories, then you still can do family history and genealogy, because there are a lot of official records. In fact, uh, we do a lot of things that become a member of the official records. When you're born, when you die, when you get married, when you get divorced, uh, when you buy land, when you go into the army, all of these things are official uh, events. And uh, one of the exciting things to do in ter terms of tracking your family history is to look at the land records. In Vermont, those land records are in at the, at the town level, so they're at the, um, the town clerk's office. And I've discovered in Vermont, at least, the town clerks are very helpful. Uh, once they discover you're looking for an ancestors, and by poking around in Vermont land records, I have sometimes been mistaken for a lawyer. And lawyers use land records, too. And often the town decides to charge the lawyer for using the records. But the moment I said I was looking for an ancestor, the town clerk gets very helpful. So, um, uh, so go looking at land records. Um, I've poked around a great many tall, small towns in Vermont, and I've never found a town clerk that wasn't helpful. And they usually know their records uh, very well, so they, they can be very helpful. I was poking around in the town clerk's office in Eden, of all places, because somebody on my mother's side of the family moved to Eden in 188. Seems like a foolhardy thing to do, but um, there were reasons for the move there. Well, I was looking at this land records, and all kinds of things are hidden in there. Uh, this um, couple had four sons and two daughters, and they were getting older. Three of the sons had moved away. So obviously they were concerned about their old age. And so right in the land records, they sell the farm to the youngest son. And that's fairly common in Vermont for the property to go to the youngest son, not the oldest. And, um, but then they insisted on a certain something in return. So in return for having the farm go to the youngest son, the youngest son agreed to all kinds of things, to take care of his parents, right down to how many rooms in the house they could use, how many cords of wood would be supplied, how many bushels of wheat, and the agreement was signed by both the son and the, and the, and the parents uh, for, to last for two years. At the end of that two years, it obviously had worked, so they extended it for three more years. Well, in that time, both of the parents died, 
And very quickly, the young son sold the farm and took off, probably to the, to the west. So the parents were quite shrewd in making sure he stayed around and took care of them during that time. I was poking around in the, in the town records in Burke at one point because, again, part of my mother's side of the family came into southern Vermont to Guilford very early in the 1760s and then worked their way up the, the um, Connecticut Valley to Burke and Lindenville. Well, here they are in Lindenville and Burke, and right in the town land records, it says that they're warned out of town. This is a, uh, a custom acquired from Great Britain. Each town was responsible for taking care of its poor citizens. Um, thus, we have poor farms uh, and uh, so forth. But what the warning out meant was that the town fathers came around and said, you've got to get out of town. Essentially, they said, we're not going to take care of you. Um, so for three years in a, war, in, a, in a row, this family was warned out of town. But they never left. Uh, their children went to the school. And eventually, they, they became substantial citizens and remained there. And that often did happen. But the town was essentially saying, we're not going to take care of you if, if you get too poor. So that's another thing you can find in, in uh, town records. Um, sometimes you can find other things as well, because there's a, there is a dark side of family history for most people. And, um, and I think it's kind of fun to explore the dark side. But I used to warn my students, um, you know, if there are family tragedies or difficulties in recent years, um, you have to be very careful and you have to use common sense about bringing certain things up. But I had a, my favorite uncle growing up was my mother's brother, Lovell Allen. Some of you may actually remember that name. Um, he had a big farm in Crassbury. I loved to visit there, particularly during sugaring season. Um, he raised racehorses, which I like to watch win at Barton Fair and other places. But I was aware, even as a youngster, that there were stories about Lovell. He drank a little too much. He caroused around a bit. And uh, so one day I was poking around, long after Lovell died, poking around in the records in Craftsbury, which are very good, by the way, unlike Greensboro, where they, they had a fire and some of the early records don't exist. Um, and Neil Goodwin, who was the town clerk and a friend of the family, came over to me with this big ledger, which was a ledger of, um, of, um, of um, vital records, listing births, deaths, marriages, and so forth. And Neil had a smile on his face, and he said, I think you'll have an interest in this record. It was 1910 the birth of a female child in Crassbury, and the form that the doctor had filled out, there was a place for mother, and he put the mother down. Then there was a blank for father, and the doctor had written in that blank, said to be Lovell Allen. <laughs> he was not saying it in the positive tense, he was just reporting the rumor that was around town. Well, I learned that I had another cousin somewhere, probably already dead. But anyway, you, there are interesting things you can find in, in, in um, um, uh, records that are, that are in the public domain. And um, you can find them in other ways, too. I have family Bible on my mother's side of the family. And the family came from Massachusetts originally before coming to Vermont. And as in many family Bibles, there's a place between the Old Testament and the New Testament, that's a place for family records. And here was a, a, a young woman, a baby born in Massachusetts in 1791. And somebody had carefully changed the one to a two. And you realized why if you flipped over another page and there were marriage records, the 
little baby was born four months after her parents were married. And that was an embarrassment, apparently, to the person who tried to change, change the record. But if you look at the social history of Western Massachusetts in the 1790s, you discover that between 25 and 30 percent of the brides were pregnant in the 1790s. This is not true earlier, and it's not true um, some decades later. So why were brides pregnant in the 1790s? That's an explanation. You know, nobody knows exactly, but one explanation is that the young women were taking charge of their lives, and instead of marrying the man in the next farm that their father had picked out for them, uh, they arranged to get pregnant and to marry the person they wanted to marry. So you can find all kinds of interesting things in records. And there are many other um, uh, kinds of records that you can look at, pension records, census records. But one of the most interesting places to look are the uh, probate records. If, if, and I have a, 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 a copy of um, inventory. Um, when you die, um, that's an official act. And your will or your estate is probated. And the probate courts in Vermont and in most states are at the county level. Um, in the county seat or the shire town as Vermonters call it. So where's the probate court for Hardwick? St. Johnsbury. Where's the probate court for Greensboro? Newport. So where's the probate court for Wolcott? Hyde Park. Well, one of my ancestors, so you're, uh, you're getting the record of one of my ancestors, my great-great-grandfather. Um, um, so I walk into the probate court in Hyde Park one day and ask for his records. And these records are in the public domain. Anyone can go in and look at them. Um, and um, one of the things that happens often, not always, but often when you die and get your estate probated is that somebody comes around and takes an inventory of your estate. So it can be passed on to the next generation. Um, and these inventories are great resources for finding out about what life was really like in another period. Um, this is my great, great grandfather. Um, and um, um, he died at the age of 37, which is far too young. Um, but um, somebody came around and listed all of the things he owned. Imagine if right now somebody went into your house and made a list of all your possessions. How much could people tell about you, your life, with those possessions? It probably would be longer than this. Um, and um, I sometimes had, have students uh, dump their pocketbooks uh, out on the desk and have them write the story of their life from what they find in their, in their pocketbooks. Um, I don't know whether you can see. It's a little dark, but um, um, this, this um, inventory um, is translated into, uh, into typing. It's, it was actually in script, of course. Um, but take a look at this, uh, and, and I'll try to analyze it. I've, I've used this for, as a teaching device and actually put it in this generation's book that I, that I wrote. Um, obviously, he owns quite a lot of land. And the land that he owns is the most valuable thing that he owns, because land was wealth in the early 19th century. Um, he's, a, he's a sheep farmer. Uh, he owns quite a number of sheep. Um, if he had lived 20 more years, and this were an inventory taken in 1857, 
he would have been a dairy farmer because the Vermont sheep industry virtually collapses because of the competition from the Midwest and from as far away as Australia. So here's this young man living in Wolcott, Vermont, who is affected by global trends, as we all are. In fact, the whole family was, in the fact they got to Wolcott was because of things happening on a wider stage, because the family had lived in southern Massachusetts and been involved in the coastal trade, and they moved to Sydney, Maine in the 1790s near Augusta, but on the Kennebec River. The Kennebec is navigable almost to Augusta, and they continue to trade up and down the coast. But in 1913, uh, President Madison instigated an embargo that completely wiped out the coastal trade. So in 1914, the family moves from Sydney, Maine to Wolcott, Vermont. Seemed like an odd choice. Uh, but the reason they moved to Wolcott was that they had relatives that were among the founders of Wolcott. Uh, usually there's a reason why people move. How do you suppose they traveled in 1814 from Augusta, Maine to Wilcott, Vermont. They, they, um, there was a turnpike, so-called, cut through Crawford Notch in 188. So they, that's the way they came, probably with an ox cart. Probably they walked with the cart carrying their possessions. And they arrive in Wilcott in 1814. And two years later, was 1816, the year that there was no summer, the year that there was a killing frost every month of the year. We now know it was caused by the, um, a volcano uh, that, that created this uh, year with no summer where all the crops died. But for these people just arriving in Wolcott, they probably thought that um, they were being uh, that God was intervening and saying this was a bad move to walk it. Um, the, um, uh, but they did, uh, they did survive there. Well, let's look at this inventory. Obviously, they're Congregationalists. He owns three pews in the Congregational Church, which was an old uh, New England custom of actually, and also early American custom in general, of selling pews and then passing them on down. The Congregational Church had lost some of its, its most extreme Calvinism by then, but they remained Congregationalists until the next generation, at least. And then, as you go down his list of things he owned, he owns a, a, a brindle cow, a red cow, or bull. Um, he owns sap buckets. He owns a gun, um, but um, uh, the NRA actually is quite interested in doing historical research and trying to prove how many uh, early Americans owned guns. There's no indication that this guy belonged to a militia or he had a gun to protect himself from foreign invaders. He uh, probably used it to shoot an occasional animal because there are some pelts there. Um, look at the other things he owned. He owned several barrels. Uh, barrels were very important in this time period. Um, in fact, um, coopers who made barrels were skilled craftsmen. And to make a barrel tight enough to hold liquid, like molasses, or a dry measure like flour, you had to be quite skilled. In fact, barrel staves were actually produced and exported. Um, and barrels um, can, uh, housed a number of things. You um, um, see, for up in the, on the second uh, level, there's 500 pounds of pork in the hog. That's probably a hogshead. Hogshead is a, is a large barrel. And the way people got through the winter in this period was 
with no real refrigeration was to salt things down. And pork was the thing you ate. Very little beef was eaten in this time period. And so you took the whole hog and salted it down into barrels. You notice over on the left-hand side, there's actually some salt. That's one thing you had to buy. You couldn't raise salt, not in, not in Vermont, at least. Um, and w the exception to the, ho the whole hog being salted down were the bacon and the hams that were often smoked, which is the other way of preserving things. Well, the whole hog went into a barrel, and as the winter progressed, you fished out pieces of the pork and fried them up. So this was, this was the heritage of my sister's hate of salt <laughs> pork. Uh, it goes back a long way because, um, and even in my father's store, in my memory, he had a barrel of salt pork. And people came in and got a half pound to put in their baked beans on Saturday night. And when you go to a baked bean supper, and you have baked beans with salt pork and molasses, you're really reproducing an old-fashioned meal because beans were dried and could be kept in that fashion. There was a phrase of, if spring came and you got to the bottom of the barrel, this was literally true. As you fished out the last piece of pork and spring came, you were very happy when you got a few, got a few grain, uh, green shoots and new produce uh, to come along. Well, let's look at other things on this um, list. There's a linen wheel and a woolen wheel. These are spinning wheels. Um, and why they're listed here, because this is the man that's died, not the woman. And the woman would have been the one that ran the spinning wheels. But obviously, whoever decided about this estate figured the, these wheels uh, were, were belonged to the, to the male. In fact, as you look at old records and with genealogy in general, there's a very great male bias uh, in these. We rarely do you find women buying land, for example, the only exception being a widow, or occasionally the, the daughter of a wealthy man turns up in the records. But in order to discover what life was like for women, you have to use your imagination in interpreting uh, some of these records. Um, so that um, as, you, as you look around at other things that he owned, down at the bottom of the first column is a cook stove. This is 1837. And this is fairly early for somebody owning a cook stove because um, most people were still cooking in their fireplaces. Um, and the cook stove is quite valuable, $20. Um, so that was beginning to change how you cook. Over on the right-hand side, there's an item called a spider. What's a spider? Anybody know what a spider is? Spider's a frying pan with legs. Um, so you cook, you put this frying pan with legs over coals or over a small fire, the edge of the fireplace, and that's how you cook. My grandmother called all frying pans spiders, as maybe your grandparents did too. So I would guess that this family probably still continued to use their fireplace uh, as to cook in, even though they had a cook stove. Um, the, imagine a woman cooking the whole meal in a fireplace, and these were big walk-in fireplaces with three or four little fires, bending over, taking care of several little pots. As you look also on this inventory, you find a kettle. Um, one is small and one is big, a cauldron kettle. The big kettle, uh, both are broken and in need of repair. But those kettles are important. The smaller kettle probably hung in the fireplace. And in that small kettle, you dumped in all kinds of stuff, some pork and some vegetables, some turnips. Um, and that's the, big, that's the 
the origin of the New England boiled dinner. And it probably wasn't very tasty, particularly after day after day, you kept dumping more stuff in and keeping it uh, bubbling along. The cauldron kettle, the big kettle, was a very important um, a thing to own because you could use it for a whole variety of things. You boil sap down to maple sugar long before there were evaporators. You could make potash using wood ashes, and that was a marketable crop, but it also could be used um, uh, in a variety of ways in place of yeast for making bread, for example. It could be also used in your uh, in, in, in lieu of a washing machine to wash your clothes in this huge cauldron kettle. Um, William Cooper, who um, was the founder of Cooperstown in the 1790s, had a great idea. He was going to rent out big kettles and have everybody make maple sugar. Then he was going to ship the maple sugar to Philadelphia where the people opposed to slavery didn't want to use cane sugar, which was, owned, which was uh, produced by slaves. The only problem was William Cooper didn't figure out how to get the sugar in the right condition, so it arrived in Philadelphia all moldy. And so it was not saleable. He tried it another year, didn't work. But he thought that if you owned enough kettles and rented them out, you could rule the world. And um, so kettles were very important. Um, there are other things that we might um, learn from this. There's a, he owns a clock. Um, actually, this young man, 37, was reasonably well off, um, mostly because his father um, had made some money in the shipping trade and so forth. But he owns a clock. He probably doesn't need a clock, except maybe to figure out how to get to church on time, because most of his life uh, was not oriented toward time, but toward tasks. Um, as, as a farmer, he would decide in the morning what to do. Some days he wouldn't work much at all. He might go fishing or raspberrying or something, but other days he worked very hard. But he was a task-oriented uh, life. Uh, no bell, no clock, no whistle to tell him when to start work, when to stop work. But some of his contemporaries in 1837 were already moving to places like Lawrence, Massachusetts and Manchester, New Hampshire, where they worked in factories. And there the whistle blew in the morning and the whistle blew at night, and they were living in a world controlled by clocks. And uh, so he was in a kind of a transition stage. Um, this is the man that dies. Um, we don't find any women's clothes or because those have been separated out. But women had certain defenses when their husband died. Um, and this becomes, this is part of British law that is adapted in the United States. Um, the widow gets a widow's dower. In other words, the widow is entitled to one-third of the estate. And often this is spelled out like the, 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 the people in the um, farm in Eden. So many rooms, so many bushels of wheat, so many cords of wood, so forth. But the widow got a third of the estate. And this law protected her against her adult sons who there was often a fear that the sons would come in and scoop up all the, the goodies, leaving the, uh, uh, the widow out. Um, so you have to interpret these, these male-oriented documents to try to figure out how the woman stood. She was left, by the way, with four children, two who quickly died, and she eventually remarried, um, as widows uh, usually did. Um, as you go further down uh, the list, you find that he owned two tables and a whole bunch of chairs. Uh, this is a little unusual. Often uh, in these um, 
earliest dates, there weren't any chairs. People sat on benches and on boxes. And they often didn't have a table. They had a big board. When we talk about um, the, paying for board and room, the board is, has a literal interpretation. You were actually uh, eight off a board. But he had a lot of chairs and a couple of tables. These inventories, by the way, are used by, by antique dealers, um, museum directors, all kinds of people to establish the provenance of particular objects. Um, so that if there's a particular uh, table or bureau, uh, one can trace it through the inventories often. And in inventories in the South, or in sometimes in the North as well, slaves were part of the inventory, because slaves were property. So in the inventory, you'd find a list of five slaves, described usually not by name, uh, but by um, uh, sex, and, and age, and then their, their, their value. Um, if we go further down, you see that this person had, uh, had um, one bed and bedding, one bedding bedding, one small bed and bedding. Well, if it, what we think of as a bed would have been called a bedstead. Uh, what bed and bedding was was essentially a mattress plus a blanket or a quilt. And a mattress was a bag filled with leaves and, and evergreen boughs. And what this bed and bedding was was really more of a roll-up kind of bed that could be put down anywhere. Because often in this time period, there weren't any separate bedrooms. There were, every room became a bedroom at night as people rolled out their, their bed and beddings on the, on the floor. We find a case of knives and forks. Um, actually, um, it, the fork is a rather recent invention. A lot of the 16th and 17th century inventories have knives and spoons, but no forks. Forks come later. And that's why Americans have a hard time eating with a fork. They use it in place of a spoon, whereas in, in England, people used a fork uh, in place of a knife, stabbing it and so forth. But that's, a, that's another story. Um, so as you look at this um, inventory, what's left out? What isn't there? Bathroom. What? Bathroom. Well, no, there were no bathrooms, of course. There was a privy, probably. And there is one kind of mystery. Uh, there's a looking glass. Well, looking glass is probably, in this period, an actual mirror. But we know in the early 18th century and the 17th century, looking glass was a euphemism for chamber pot. And there's no chamber pot listed here, so this looking glass may be a chamber pot, which is a real necessary thing if you have a privy. Um, be the, um, well, there are, there are a number of things that are left out if you look at it carefully. There, of course, there's no electric lights. There's not even any kerosene lamps. They're not invented until about the time of the Civil War. There's no candles. There's no whale oil lamp, although there is a light stand, and maybe that's where the lamp went. Um, but whatever there, there was for light, it was dark in this house. Um, the, um, there's no plow. There's no scythe, although this man did have a father and a brother also living nearby, so things like that may have been shared. Uh, with um, uh, with this, and and as you and of course from the modern perspective, there's a great deal of other things missing. There's no upholstered furniture, for example. Um, the furniture, whatever there is, a bureau. Uh, there's a um, a chest. Um, 
There are no closets in houses in this period, uh, so storage uh, becomes portable. Um, there, um, um, what's a nappy? On the right-hand side, there's one, one nappy. A nappy may be a cloth diaper, although it can be a shallow pan as well. And where the place it is in the, in the um, inventory, it probably is a, a shallow pan. Um, there's a dozen printed plates and a dozen edge plates and a tea set. These were probably imported, um, as fine china was in, in those days which would indicate that they had some prized possessions that they carried with them from Massachusetts to Maine to Wolcott, Vermont. Um, if you look over here, he has a, a pair of thin boots, a pair of thin shoes, and horsehide shoes. He may have had the best shoes made by a cobbler, but he may have probably made other shoes himself. And you should remember that in this time period, there's no left shoe and right shoe. Shoes are the same for both feet. Imagine when you put on your shoes in the morning, think of shoes that, that, are, that are so designed that they would fit either foot. And imagine what long heights must have been like. Uh, anyway, you can go on and on and try to read between the lines in these inventories. Uh, and try to imagine what life was like for people in that, uh, in that time period. But I think I will stop, and maybe you'll have some questions. But anyway, good hunting, and you're looking for your, for your family ancestors and for interpretation of what life was like in another time period. Anybody got a question? Remember the spoon shed whistle? I do remember. Four times a day? Four times a day, yep. Uh, it seems to me it was seven and four. Is that correct? Seven, noon, one, and four. But people got out at four. I think that was the union that, <laughs> that uh, insisted on that. But no, we, in, um, in Hardwick, we, we uh, even after the granite sheds, more or less ceased, we still had that whistle. And um, we heard that. And you remember we had um, uh, the, uh, the bell on the Congregational Church, or the United Church, um, was where the fire alarm was. And we, we all had next to our telephone a code for, for where the fires were. So, and I don't remember the code, but, but we heard uh, the, the, the bells go off, and then everybody would get, hop in their car and chase the fire engine. Um, and um, um, the, um, so we lived in, we lived in an in a, um, industrial town in, in Hardwick, and, and so things were, and, and people took their dinner, not their lunch, but their dinner, uh, to work in not lunch pails, but dinner pails. Um, and you remember how they looked uh, uh, often. At, um, other questions or suggestions? Uh, I used Generations teaching class a few times, and the, uh, uh, some people had families that I knew. The family secrets that came out that I didn't particularly want to know. But uh, did you run into that? Oh yes, all the time. <laughs> I I had one young Italian gentleman in my class in Philadelphia who caused a family crisis, and they had a family meeting to decide whether he could research his family history, and they voted that he couldn't. Um, so we invented another project for him. Um, and I had other kinds of uh, people. I had um, young women who were adopted. And I had uh, two women who spent the semester uh, finding their birth mother. 
And in one case, they, she actually found the birth mother. And uh, I would always make a little speech about, we all come from ordinary families and we don't have any famous ancestors, but that's all right, they're important too. So I had um, one young man come up to me after class sort of tentatively and said, uh, I do come from a famous family, he said. Um, he, his father was Bill Haley of Bill Haley and the Comets. Um, <laughs> And actually, he'd actually been, uh, his, his parents were divorced, so he really had little contact with his father. So he spent the semester finding his father. And his paper was about the history of rock and roll, <laughs> <laughs> rather than, and, uh, and, and I have other, other uh, occasions too, where the families were divorced and doing a family project uh, created all kinds of tension, so I, I had to operate like a psychiatrist and, and, uh, and uh, uh, urge uh, care. But I had some students that used it as an excuse to go to Florida or spring break to interview their grandparents. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, but in general, it was an, it was an interesting way. And, and, and often I used this device rather than a final exam. They worked on it all, all semester. And I must say that at the end of the semester, reading these family projects was a lot more interesting than reading final exams. Um, but um, yeah, it, um, I did uh, that book with a, a former student of mine, Jim Watts, who taught at City College. And um, so we had two urban colleges that we were working on. And, and um, I talked about this in various parts of the country. And so if you if you use this technique in a small rural college, then you had trouble. If you, if you use it at a more elite college where everybody came from miles away, it wasn't as effective. But, um, but trying to place your own grandparents into, into history um, was an effective way. Um, and you, you know where you were born and when you were born um, becomes one of the crucial things. I had a, a, a great-grandfather that was born in 1834, a grandfather was born in 1864, father that was born in 1894. If I had followed that 30-year pattern, I would have been born in 1924, and I would have been 18 years old in 1942, and immediately drafted into the Army. I was born seven years later in 1931, and that made a lot of difference. Actually, I have frequently told my Dartmouth classmates that they're successful, and they've been quite successful as a class, not because they were brilliant and hardworking, which they think they are, but because they were born in 1931. Um, we were those of us born in 31, or 32, or 33, or 34, we were too young for World War II, too old for Vietnam. We, if we went to college, we got deferred through the Korean War. Um, and then we went off to graduate school or professional schools. We got out into the job market or the late 50s early 60s, and there were jobs. Um, um, I'm told that the birth rate this year is very low. So these little babies born, born this year may, may do all right. But if you're born in a high birth rate year, no matter what you do, and of course, you, you do affect your own destiny in many ways, but often you are the victim or the the beneficiary of the time and place that you were born. And nobody asks you about that. It's, you don't have any choices. But, um, so think about the larger patterns of how your family uh, fits into things. One of the things that I do when I'm doing family history is for you know, great grandparents and further back is find the year they were born or the year they were married and see what's going on in the world at that time. Yeah. Because my great my grandfather was born in 1885, and that's when um, the uh, Statue of Liberty came to the United States. 
You know, and it's kind of fun to put it together, right, right. something that we can understand. Well, the, the new kinds of genealogy has opened up all kinds of possibilities. There's a lot of interest in the French-Canadian background, for example. And, and if you are French-Canadian, you're pr product and part of the migration out of, out of Canada. Um, if you're, come, you're an East European Jew, or if you come from Ireland, the other thing is there's a lot of hate and prejudice and anger and resentment in our history. And uh, often we're victims of that. I have um, one branch of my mother's side of the family are Scotch-Irish, or more accurately, Ulster Scots. They came to Marblehead, Massachusetts in 1919, and they were definitely not welcome there because they were Presbyterians and not Congregationalists. Um, people from Ireland, people from Italy, people from a great many other places faced all kinds of prejudice uh, when they got to this uh, country. And, uh, uh, and of course, we're, we're hearing a lot about immigration right now. Yeah. And uh, in some ways, we're reproducing. I was talking to my younger son, married uh, an Italian family, and I was at, um, at Easter, I was sitting next to this young man, and he was telling me how, uh, how his family uh, from Italy came to the country in 1902, and they came legally, he said, and everything was fine. I said to him calmly, good thing you came in 1902, and 19, rather than 1924, because in 24 there was a quota that limited the number of Italians coming into the country. He'd never heard that. Uh, so we're all victims of, the, of uh, these kind of things. And, and the, the, um, um, the migration, immigration, um, if you go to the oldest cemetery in Hardwick, the, on Hardwick Street, there's a gravestone for Alpha Warner, who was sometimes credited with founding Hardwick. The gravestone says, born in Hardwick, Massachusetts, died in Chillicothe, Ohio. He stayed in Hardwick long enough to lose one wife and a couple of children, and then, but he moved from Massachusetts to Vermont out to Ohio. And that's a pattern that, that, that happens for a lot of people. I was um, poking around in the manuscript archives at the University of Wisconsin, the Wisconsin State Historical Society, when I was doing graduate work there, looking at the finding aids, and I saw Hardwick, Vermont. And it turned out there was a man named Dustin Grow Cheever who moved from Hardwick, Vermont to southern Wisconsin in 1851. And uh, the fact, he was a, became very successful and eventually uh, uh, brought his parents out there and so forth. But I actually did a little article on him. But one of the things he mentions in a letter back home, and when he gets here, he's very homesick. Um, uh, somebody writes in from Hardwick saying, 1851, 13 young men left Hardwick for California in one day, if you can imagine. Um, there was no train. What? There was no train. There was no I was going to ask you, how did they go? Well, they probably went as a group. And there, were, there were actually three ways you could go. The cheapest and the longest was to go overland and through the mountains. The, the, you could go completely around the Horn, or the way most people went was to get to Boston or New York and take a ship to the Isthmus of Panama, no canal, and then you'd usually ride by mule across the Isthmus and get another ship to, to, uh, to, to San Francisco. And, uh, but you can imagine the wanderlust. This Cheever uh, decided he was going to go somewhere in 1851. He thought of Australia because he'd raised some sheep and he heard they raised sheep in Australia. Um, he thought about California, but the reason he went to Wisconsin was that his 18-year-old sister had gone out the year before and his mother was worried about the sister. Uh, and so he goes to Wisconsin. Um, and it, 
it takes him a long time to get there. He does, in 1851, take a train or the cars for very brief pieces and then other trips on the lakes and takes him about 20 days to get there. But to just tell you one little story and then I'll quit. Um, before he leaves Hardwick, he goes around to see his parents, to say goodbye to them. And he assumes that he's never going to see them again. I mean, today, young people take off halfway around the world and they expect to have instant communication with their parents and probably to visit. But in 1851, if you went that far away, you didn't ever expect to be back or to see your parents again. So that's the difference between 1851 and 2019. So I'll quit. <laughs>